Hi, I'm Shannon Stewart. I'm a professor at University of Wisconsin at Whitewater, and I help coordinate the Endless Possibilities Conference that's typically offered on campus. This year, however, we're virtual, and our keynote speaker is filmmaker Dan Habib. And we're so excited to do a short interview with him today, or at least I am. A um, little bit of background about the Endless Possibilities Conference. This year's theme is successful transitions. And boy, do we need it. We're really focusing on practicing some time for self-care, um, joy, humor, gratitude, and we're looking at a time for families and educators, service providers, and this year we had some teams too, coming together to discuss what we can do to transition into this fall together successfully. The conference is always a time to work together as families and school districts community service providers as well. And we always have parent scholarships available. So I want folks to know that there are scholarships available for families to attend too. Dan, I'm so glad that you're here with us. We are so fortunate. Dan is a documentary filmmaker and I've shown his films in all of my undergraduate classes and some of my graduate classes too. He's a parent advocate, director of the Inclusive Communities Project at the Westchester Institute for Human Development. Wanted to make sure I got all that right. And this year he is our keynote for our conference. He's also a husband and a father of two sons, um, Betsy McNamara. And he has a 24 year old son named Isaiah and a 21-year-old son named Samuel. And Samuel experiences a disability. And they live together in um, Concord, New Hampshire. Did I get that correct, Dan? Yeah, Concord, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us just a little bit about your work and how you became involved in it? Sure, and thanks for having me. I'm so excited for this conference. It's going to be amazing. Um, I, I was a photojournalist for 20 years before becoming a filmmaker, actually. That was my first career. And um, long story short, when, when Sam was quite young, about three years old, he actually got really sick at one point. He got um, pneumonia from a tonsillectomy that, had, that didn't go quite right. He had aspirated some blood. And at that point, he was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And um, his doctor actually turned to me, who's still one of his doctors to this day, and said, you know, once I was out of the woods and feeling better, he said, have you ever thought about telling your own story of what it's like to be a parent of a child with a chronic health condition, a disability? And I hadn't. You know, my work was always focused on other people's stories through my photojournalism. But in the hospital, I just started taking some pictures, honestly, just to burn off some of the stress and anxiety I was feeling. And that early phase of documentary work turned into the film eventually about four years later, including Samuel, which came out in 2007, 2008. And uh, I was just hoping the film might have some impact in New Hampshire, might really encourage people to be more um, enthusiastic for inclusive practices, because that was something we were really experiencing at that point. We wanted Samuel to feel like he belonged and was included in his local school, but it, it really just took off. The film, including Samuel, through word of mouth, took off. It got translated into 17 languages. It was, it's was it been used all over the world now for a, a catalyst for inclusive education, disability rights. And that helped me transition to my, my previous job, uh, which I recently left at the University of New Hampshire. And now I'm full time continuing to make films. Uh, boy, what is it? 13 years later. And, and I've, I've made dozens of films, including four kind of major films. And uh, I'll be showing some of that work at the conference. Fantastic. Will you have any of the clips from your um, the transition film clips? Oh, yeah. So, you know, as you can appreciate, given that Samuel's 21, I mean, we've had transitions for both of our kids into adulthood. My older son, Isaiah, doesn't have a disability, but everyone needs to figure out how they're going to transition to adulthood. And it's not simple for anybody with all the choices and challenges and things they need to navigate. And, and certainly Isaiah has had his share, but he's doing great. He's actually right now salmon fishing in Alaska, commercial salmon fishing 
and he lives in Prescott, I mean, excuse me, in Flagstaff, Arizona, full time. He went to Prescott College in Arizona. So he's doing great, uh, my 24 year old. And Samuel, of course, experiences a disability. And our life has been full of transition, you know, realities for the last six, seven years. But really, I think transition starts much younger. You know, I think when a kid's two or three years old, even, they're making decisions about what they want to wear, what they want to eat, where they want to go. That self determination starts very young. Yes. And so transition's been, you know, a, a big piece of my work for really the last 10 years. But most recently with the film Intelligent Lives that came out in 2019, that film's all about transition. And as part of that film, I did four short films on post-secondary transition. And I'll be showing uh, clips from those films definitely during the conference. Oh, fantastic. Those are those are excellent short clips. I, yeah, we love those. Thanks. Yeah. Um, How do you think just a little bit more about how transition surrounds the work you do on inclusion? You know, when the first graduate class I ever had, very first session, first class, my professor said career development is a lifelong process beginning at birth. And that small statement was the thing that got me into the work that I'm doing now and the support I, I'm doing, um, not just for students, but for families as well too, because they truly are, you know, important concepts and together. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see those two? Well, I think, I think the whole special education experience and which includes of course, IEP development, can either be a wonderful opportunity for transition or it can be an impediment to transition, frankly. I think if a student does not feel fully engaged, have a sense of ownership over that process, if the families feel um, you know, nervous or not welcome through that process, that can be a huge impediment. So the keynote that I'm giving at the conference it's actually less based on my films and more based on my experience and what I've learned around the country around how to meaningfully engage and involve families and students in the whole process of special education and IEP development. So we've picked up a lot of tips and tricks through our work with Samuel. I've studied people's um, experiences and expertise around the country. And I try and bring together as many ideas as I can in a very accessible, interactive way with people. How can you authentically include students and their families in the whole process of special education and IEP development. So I think that every juncture in the process is an opportunity to build up a student's self-determination, their sense of agency within their life and their education. Um, and I'm a really big fan of students co-leading or leading their own IEP meetings. So I'll talk quite a bit about that. I also really believe that if a student is, is meaningfully and authentically included throughout their whole process of special education, IEP development, it, it informs transition significantly and, and fuels a positive transition process. And, and I also talk quite a bit in this uh, keynote around person-centered planning and how the idea of having a student have an opportunity to bring people around them that they trust and care about and that care about them to help them think about their goals, their dreams and how to achieve them. That's, that all should be woven into this process. I don't think these are separate pillars, you know, IEP, transition, right. person-centered planning, they should all be integrated. And that's, I think that's really the key. And, and also schools shouldn't work in isolation. They should be partnering with air, the agencies in the community that support adults with disabilities, with vocational rehabilitation, with college and career development uh, counselors, guidance counselors, that should all be integrated, but it's not happening often enough, I think in our, in our society. Yeah, I think we, I agree with you completely. And I think the participants in this, you know, this year's conference will completely agree to. Um, we're so looking forward to having you. Uh, anything else that you'd like to share? Um, I just think that what, one of the things I love about my work is that I get the chance to go and film in some really incredible communities, schools, families, people's lives. And, and my goal is just to bring those sometimes very intimate telling um, moments and, and practices that I get to witness to the larger audience. And, and I, I'm, I'm not only am I going to, I think, I hope, provide a lot of really great information and inspiration during the presentation, 
I'm going to provide a lot of resources, free resources that people can access online from my short films and discussion guides to educational materials. So I'm, I want to make sure that everyone who comes to this conference walks away feeling like, wow, that is really going to support our work going forward on inclusion, on transition, and on making sure everyone has the opportunity for a full adult life of joy and work and relationships and community living and all the things that we all want for our young people. Wow. Thank you so much, Dan. We're really looking forward to the conference on Friday. I am as well. Thanks for having August. me. I can't wait. August 6th. Yeah, we'll see you then. I really can't wait to be with everybody. All right. We'll see you then, Dan. Thank Thanks. you.